So we're going to dive right in. I just want to say there is no more important topic in the world right now. The one thing we've learned from the pandemic in the last few months is that vaccinations help. You get vaccinated, your society, your country is more likely to emerge from lockdowns. It is more likely to have life come back to normal. We're seeing that in parts of the United States and the UK. We're not seeing that in other parts of the world, um, which are still have real shortages. Uh, of vaccines. And uh, as you said, what we're here today to discuss is to try and understand how to debunk myths around vaccines, how to get over vaccine hesitancy. Specifically, we're going to focus on South Asia today, which as you all know, is a region that encompasses one fourth of the world's population, includes Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. So let's dive right in. Dr. Yunus, let me start with this. How bad is the problem with vaccine misinformation in South Asia? Thank you very much for having me, Ravi. And I think the problem is, is bad, of course, because there are multiple issues here. Number one is the availability of vaccine. It's not as available everywhere. Number two is acceptance of vaccine, the hesitation. And then number three is this inherent problem that even us scientists or doctors cannot answer fully as to which one is best because there are seven or eight vaccines available in the world and none of them were tried head to head. So these three problems in itself, and then on top of that, you just sprinkle that with the misinformation and the infertility and the DNA alteration and the chips that Bill Gates is going to put in them. I mean, of course I'm joking. And you combine all of that and we are, we are in a mess. We are in a mess if that happens. I just want to remind all of you who are watching from around the world, I want to bring in your questions. So send them in on the Zoom Q&A button. And as they come in, I'll try and incorporate them. Tell us your names, where you're writing from. Um, you can also ask questions in English um, or in Hindi or Urdu. And the reason why I say that is that, look, English speakers in South Asia represent a section of the population, maybe you know, 300 million or so across the region. Um, but we may have a likelihood of reaching more people in Hindi or Urdu. So as this discussion goes on, I don't want to exclude people who don't speak Hindi or Urdu, but we may repeat small little bites in those languages so that we can cut them and disseminate them on WhatsApp. More on that in a bit. Um, but Dr. Yunus, let me ask you, you know, so much of this right now, like in the US where you and I both are, um, the, the reason why vaccine hesitancy is becoming a big topic is the fact that currently uh, supply outstrips demand. So here in the US, we were not talking about vaccine hesitancy three or four months ago. Back then it was all about let's get supply out there. In large parts of South Asia, um, there's still, as you said, a supply problem, um, but that's uneven. So in Pakistan specifically, for example, um, I'm told that the supply is more or less there now, but there's also a demand problem. Um, tell us a little bit more about what drives that demand problem. Let's talk about some of the reasons why people might be less likely to want to get vaccinated. Sure. So first of all, I believe, Ravi, that we need to come from a place of respect, because if you ask this question from me last year at this time, I was one of those who were hesitant because I had a lot of questions when this vaccine comes in. How can a vaccine be developed in a year which I've never seen before? Talking of US, in December, I was giving talks in the hospitals in US about vaccine hesitancy because I knew that we will get into this place. So number one, communication needs to start months in advance, not when you are in the midst of a crisis. A lot of hesitancy, like anything else, like technology adaption, what do we talk of early adapters and then people in the middle and then laggards, right? So similarly, there were about one third of the population that was just itching to get vaccinated. They have, they're optimists. They just embrace things very quickly. You don't have to convince them. There's a large swing vote, as we say, in the middle, the 50, 60% who are convincible, who are simply asking valid, logical questions. And then there may be another 10, 20, 30%, depending upon the country, that's just not going to move no matter what you say. So I'm always after that middle 50, 60% because they have reasonable questions. And I think in different countries, there are, and I, I say this because I think it's absolutely true. People may not like it, but 
countries that have politicized the virus have suffered greater losses. I, I think there's a whole program you can do on that and the data will prove. So the virus lives in the large ecosystem of religious, political, social beliefs and what the influencers are saying and doing and what the background of vaccination in that history, in that country is. For example, in Pakistan, like you said, I think the connection of polio vaccine and how it was linked to bin Laden and all those political overtures cannot be simply removed from the history that has shaped a certain narratives in people's mind. It has created a level of hesitancy, which unfortunately those poor people are gonna end up paying the price, but that's why we need more intense efforts in some areas as compared to others. Uh, just for our viewers who aren't familiar with the Osama bin Laden uh, case and the polio vaccine, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, sure. I think what, at least what I read in the newspapers, what the common narrative is that it was sort of an undercover vaccine operation that was used to create a facade to get to bin Laden. So, of course, people who were, and then those doctors and people involved in there also suffered, but all of that is in the public domain. All I'm saying is that those things then get used and abused and discussed in the media in a very negative way in, in developing countries in any place of the world. I mean, trust in public information is a delicate thing. And I'm not saying that this somehow makes it right. But when we come to convince someone to talk to people about vaccine hesitancy, I don't like the blanket label of anti-vaxxer on anyone who's just hesitant. I think people have reasonable questions. For example, here in US, the African-American community is hesitant for a reason. If you look at the history of US and the Tuskegee trials and the enormous amount of wrong that has been done in the name of race, uh, if I'm an African-American, my hesitancy has certain roots in that history. And if you don't acknowledge those roots, you're not gonna be able to convince me. Yeah, I hear you on that. So let me ask you, I guess, two questions. And I'll ask the first one first, um, in that if both at an individual level and then at a policy level for countries. So at the individual level, if I had to convince an acquaintance, someone who is, as you put it, vaccine hesitant, um, who's not an anti-vaxxer, I don't want to disrespect this person, I don't want to talk down to this person, but I want to convince this person that, listen, this is why you should get vaccinated. And I've struggled with this, by the way. I mean, in, in, in the area that I live, even here in New York, um, I've had a circumstance where um, someone's come up to me and said, yeah, it's not for me. You know, I'm young, I'm strong, I don't need this. What is the best way to convince a person in your life without getting political, without getting left or right, um, that this is good for you and this is what you should do? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Did you hear my question? Which is I basically, think I got the gist of it, the that how do you convince someone on an individual level? That's right. And I think, again, I approach it in a very customized fashion. I simply spend, if I have 10 minutes, I'm going to spend five, six minutes listening to their concerns. I'm simply going to probe deeper. What is your concern? Like I gave the example, an African-American in U.S. is going to have a very different concern as compared to someone who lives in a village of Pakistan who may have been told that there is pork in this vaccine, as compared to someone else who may be worried about Bill Gates tracking them through a chip, as compared to someone else who may be on three different medications or may have had an allergic reaction to peanuts or penicillin. So those are the valid reasons. Some people have had history of allergy. I gotta reassure them that, look, your prior history of allergy has zero correlation with this vaccine. And plus, we are going to observe you for 15 or 30 minutes. And plus, that risk is two out of a million. And that's likely to convince them. An African-American USA, I'm simply going to show them the picture of that African-American researcher from NIH, who has been one of the founding members of the Moderna vaccine. So they can understand how far the country has come. And the level of uh, ethics in our current research is very different than what their grandfathers went through. Uh, someone, you know, so the, the, the similarly, my point really is, 
people have individual concerns, you listen to them and you simply address that individual concern. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, what about at the policy level? And as I'm asking this question, again, I want to encourage our viewers around the world, hit the Q&A button on Zoom, uh, type in your questions. Um, if you have anything specific and no question is too big or too small, we want to involve you. We want to make sure that what we're, what we're discussing here is relevant uh, to you. And if there are ways in which we can advise or help, we want to do that. Um, but continue with my question, uh, Dr. Yunus. Um, so that's the individual level. If you hypothetically had to advise, um, say the Prime Minister of India or the Prime Minister of Pakistan, given what you've seen so far, um, given the missteps that have been made so far, but let's move that aside, looking at the next few months, what would you be telling them? Exactly. And I think first we have to acknowledge that there have been missteps, number one. And the fact is this work needed to start six months ago, because when you're talking policy, you're increasing the scope and scale to many, many, many times. And therefore you need to increase the lead time many, many, many times as well. Now it's not a 10 minute conversation, right? Because now you're talking to so many different audiences. So the chances we had available six months ago, we don't have today. But unfortunately, fortunately, the chances we have today, we are not going to have them six months from now. So to your point, yes, let's look forward. I think number one is don't oversell it. Be very transparent. Nothing is 100% safe. When we oversell something, when we try to say this is 100% safe, I think that's scientifically inaccurate and that does not breed trust. Number two, the best thing is let the experts do the talking. Doctors should not be talking about politics. Politicians should not be advising people about vaccines. It's not going to breed trust. You don't have the expertise. You may have a title, you may have the authority, right? Bring people, and when you talk of experts, have pick bipartisan experts not someone who just belongs to your party and always aligns with your political positions. You're trying, this is a public health emergency. And after that, I think really pick influencers from every segment of your society. Businessmen, religious leaders, political leaders, entertainment leaders, it has an impact. And these are basically all those same marketing strategies that people use for selling shampoo, right? It's the same thing at the end of the day, you want mass appeal, but the only difference is this time it's not about business. It's about improving and saving lives. And the last point I would say is that you can never have a government official undermining that process in any way, right? That is devastating. If you're on one end trying to promote vaccine and then someone who is in, in a situation of influence, whether that's a government level or a big media personality, anyone who has reach, if they are peddling pseudoscience, you got to confront them in a respectable but firm way. If you let that go, you're going to create a, a huge divide. Right. And, and that's the hardest thing, in my opinion. It is. It is. Um, and this is in part because, you know, I know in India, there are some leaders, for example, who've come out and said, you know, I drink cow's milk or, you know, I, I, I sort of use Ayurvedic methods and I don't need to trust in Western science. Um, I know in, um, in parts of Pakistan, for example, there are fears that taking a vaccine could somehow lead to infertility, um, that um, again, that there may be some nefarious designs involved in these things, and especially when it comes from people in some positions of power. And by this, I mean not only politicians, but also community leaders. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things um, we haven't talked about yet is the strength and power of, of community leaders, because ultimately, you know, it's one thing for prime ministers and big leaders to make a splash, but when it comes to things like encouraging people to take the vaccines, um, especially in rural communities, uh, the role of local council people, uh, local trusted authorities, um, even sort of self-appointed sort of, you know, um, um, you know, like village heads, village chiefs, the mukhiyas, um, they have immense influence. Yeah. Um, so what is your sense of the best way to get them on board? Exactly. So first of all, I always say, Cow's milk is great, Ayurveda, yoga, ginger, all of that is great. 
but it's not a replacement for the vaccine. That's going to give you specific antibodies, right? So this is not a binary. We're not trying to say, don't do that. Keep doing that, but just add the specific intervention of the vaccine. The second point about influencers, I mean, it takes a lot of time. You know, you go in concentric circles. Again, you start with the core nucleus of the government, and then you, after you have that guiding coalition, then you divide and conquer. You say, all right, I'm going to go after this audience and I'm going to go after that audience. But in this situation where we are so strapped for time, where everything needed to happen yesterday, I would even take it from the Mukia level to the next level of family influencers. You know, I'm going to give you something very personal here. Uh, my mother, God bless her sweet soul, did not complete high school, but she was my university. If she said something, the whole family followed. It carried weight. She would make one phone call from Pakistan saying, there's this poor girl, I'm trying to get her married. Are you guys going to pitch in something? And before we knew it, she'd collect hundreds of thousands of dollars because that's the, you know, that's the gravitas of her word. And I, I can't believe and that trust. I was the only mother, right? That's the trust. trust. Exactly. So I think I can't believe she was the only mother in the world like that. So every society, every group of people has a, a, a matriarch, a patriarch like that. So I think everybody needs to understand their responsibility. And on a government level, on a healthcare level, we need to reach out to those people directly and spend and invest the time so they can multiply the effort. Because you and I cannot reach to everyone, nor will we have the trust of everyone. Yeah, I think what you're saying really resonates um, at the family level. I have similar experiences. And I think the issue of trust just cannot be emphasized enough. You know, yep. it's hard to trust in political leaders at a time when the world is so polarized, at a time when we trust different types of leaders on different issues and we're divided along spectrums of yep. left and right and regions and especially in South Asia where so much of it can be caste-based or, sure. or society-based or language-based. Um, and what cuts through uh, then instead of political affiliations is, as you put it, doctors, experts, uh, local communities, people that people, human to human connections yep. that you can yep. trust. Now, equally, there's the flip side of this, right? Where you have mal actors who can very easily spread uh, misinformation at the speed of the internet. So they get on social media, they say something incredibly irresponsible. Uh, and we've seen this in America as well with prominent uh, anchors, politicians. Uh, we see this in South Asia. Um, what's your sense of how best to combat mass social media disinformation and misinformation? Sure, I think you combat bad information with lots of good information. Of course, we live we all want a world where despite whatever the risks, people should be able to express themselves. So I will never argue that someone's, you know, mic should be taken away from them. But, you know, what, what do they say? All, all that is needed for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And I think that is unfortunately true because for whatever reason, a lot of good people are silent. And I think the responsibility is, and I'll say it bluntly, we all have to control our own nutcases because in every group, there are some people, like you said, who will use that influence. But this is about human lives. This is not about elections. This is not about making billions of dollars. This is not about becoming famous and popular. This is literally a time where humanity is going through a mass trial. And I'll tell you, I've been doing this over two decades, Ravi. The last year of my life, was the most purpose-driven professionally for me because I literally found my purpose. And I, again, I can't be the only one. I think a lot of us found that purpose. So what we need to do is we're in a very timely, less emotional, more factual fashion, confront those claims, which are always very easy to rebut. And as I'm telling you, I'm, I'm bone tired. I really want to just end this, go home and just unplug but I see the harm that can come from those myths. And that just keeps me going that, all right, you know, let's just do another one month because I know people are gonna lose their lives. Yeah, it is a matter of life and death. And, you know, we don't say this enough, but, but I, I can't thank you enough. And, 
your cohort, your fellow medical professionals, sure. for Lots the work of that you do Lots. day in and day out, uh, and the time you take out to speak to people like me, um, who are trying to get out the word, but really we rely on the experts. We rely on, on your advice uh, and your guidance and your advocacy. Um, so to that end, um, look, and I wanted to keep most of this discussion in English. I think that's very important because as we all know, um, there are so many languages that are spoken across uh, South Asia. And in a sense, English is the, the, the common thread among them all. But look, since I'm a Hindi speaker, I know you're an Urdu speaker. Um, and I want to be able to um, have us, you know, in, in, in a sense of virality, because as you say, the, the one way to, to combat bad information is more good information. So let's just try a, a wee bit of a role play here. So imagine that I am a local village councilman um, in an unnamed village in the Hindi Urdu heartland, uh, so somewhere between <laughs> India and Pakistan. And I, um, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical about the vaccine. I, you know, have been telling people in my community, and everyone trusts me because I have the loudest voice in my village. Um, and I've been telling them, I don't know. I'm just not sure. Just drink milk, be strong, do the yoga, have the ginger lemon tea at night. You know, do the Ayurveda stuff. Worked for our forefathers. It's going to work for me. I don't need any of this government stuff. I don't trust government that much. I don't trust science that much. You saw what happened the last time. So that's my position. How would you explain to me? In fact, go ahead and explain to me. 60 seconds. How, how why in should English I trust or vaccines? In Urdu this time. Go for it. Sure. So, I will ask you to ask what your life is in your life. Your business is closed. Your school is closed. Whatever your life is in the town, it can be fine from this vaccine. क्योंकि कोई ना कोई मुश्किल है आपके पास इस वक्त और यह वैक्सीन करोड़ों लोगों को दुनिया में लग चुकी है और करोड़ों जाने अब इससे बचेंगी अमेरिका में जनवरी में हर महीने में 5 से 4 4 से 5000 लोग मर रहे थे अब 4 से 500 लोग मर रहे हैं जिसकी सिर्फ वजह यह वैक्सीन है अगर अभी तक आप बचे हुए हैं तो हो सकता है कल एक बहुत बड़ी लहर एक बहुत बड़ी वेव आपके गांव में आ जाए और आप कैसे याद रखना क्या-क्या चाहते हैं आपके लोग आपको कैसे याद रखें कि हमारे गांव के मुखिया ने हमें मरवा दिया था या हमारे गांव के मुखिया ने हमें बचाया था उस वक्त तो मेरी तो आपसे यह गुजारिश होगी कि अपने सब सवाल हमसे पूछिए हम आपको बताते हैं कि इसमें क्या फायदे क्या नुकसान है आपको सब बात मुकम्मल तौर पे सच्ची तरह बताएंगे और उसके बाद आप सबसे पहले यह वैक्सीन लगवाइए अपने फैमिली को कहिए कि वो यह वैक्सीन लगाएं ताकि जब आज से 50 साल के बाद लोग याद करेंगे आपको कि आपने उनकी जानें बचाई थी आपने उनके बिजनेसेस को प्रोटेक्ट किया था so that's how I would probably convince them. That's excellent. That's just excellent. For those of you who don't speak uh, Urdu, um, uh, what Dr. Yunus was saying was basically that vaccines have really worked in the U.S. Uh, the death rates in the U.S. went from four or five thousand a month to four or five hundred a month, and the only reason behind that is vaccines. You may have stayed safe so far, but if you did, uh, that's no guarantee. Another wave could hit your village. And then you would end up being the village leader that denied your people the right to live because you denied them vaccines. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. You want to be the person that's leading from the front, encouraging people to take vaccines. This is science. It works. It's been proven. And you need to make sure that people take it. That was, I think, the gist of your how did you How did you do that marvelous translation? I am absolutely floored. <laughs> Well, well, that, that that's the uh, the only skill us journalists have, which is to which is to to repeat what other people say that was and, awesome. and to translate. Um, really so, awesome. Well, thank you. I want to bring in some of our viewer questions. So Eric uh, asks via email, uh, and I'll just read out his question. He says, "You mentioned trust and the unique circumstances that lead to vaccine hesitancy." How well are governments in the region doing to reach out to trusted leaders, be it religious or otherwise, to address specific concerns? And related to that, he says, what to do when such leaders are purposefully not willing to listen or they take a politically motivated stance? Sure. So, number one, I don't live in India or Pakistan, so I'm a couple of steps removed. And I'll just admit that right up front. I think someone in the government on the front lines in those areas probably knows best. My, I think, good of people and my 
guess is that they're trying to do a lot of that outreach. How good, how specific, honestly, someone locally can answer that. As I already told you, I'm a strong believer that you need, you know, disinformation has a certain energy to it. You need to counter it with similar matching level of energy. You can't be lukewarm about it unless you want people to die. You can't be lukewarm about it unless to you, your own position is very important. And that is why I think I always try to keep telling people, this is not about business. This is not about politics. This is not about, not about personal fame. You truly have to believe that this is once in a lifetime purpose-driven moment for you to make your mark. Go out and do something truly for the sake of humanity. I cannot, I know this is a biggest cliche in medicine. I want to save humanity. But if there was ever a time where that cliche was true, it's now. So I'm very passionate and I want people to be very passionate about confronting that disinformation. So far, what I see is a lot of time we're lukewarm, we are defensive, and we just let that disinformation, that disinformation comes with a level of almost, I would say, not passion, it's aggression. Yeah. It comes in a way as if everybody else doesn't know what they're talking about. And unless you respond to it with the same defense, people are going to lose their lives. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's uh, conspiracy theories can be powerful because they're, yeah. they're putting forward alternate theories. And, and to do so, one has to be convinced, as, as you say. Um, exactly. Uh, and my one very quick point, Ravi, is I think we have to also understand sometimes we say, well, it's, it's just kindness. It's an act of goodness. We're all about kindness. But kindness is also dependent upon the situation. There's a law of the situation. Your soldier who's fighting and trying to protect a country is not trying to be kind, right? You won't call him ruthless, but his situation demands to use very aggressive measures. And right now we need to be very clear. To me, I can either be kind with that conspiracy theorist or I can be kind with millions of people who are innocent and are going to be beguiled. So I choose to be kind to those people and very passionate and sometimes very direct with the conspiracy theorists. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a question from uh, Ram Kumar from Lalitpur in Nepal. And um, his question goes, in your opinion, is there one piece of disinformation about COVID-19 floating out there in South Asia that needs to be tackled immediately, that needs to be prioritized first and foremost, knowing very well that there are just too many to tackle at the same time? Sure. I think there's still that one piece is COVID is no big deal. Still, there is significant denial that this is just cough and sniffles and everybody gets better so far, I will also get better. And then every misinformation, disinformation actually stems from that root. And people either don't understand or don't want to understand that 1% risk of death and maybe 10% risk of hospitalization is easy if the world just had 100 people but the world has 7.8 billion people and 1% of that will be a catastrophe that we cannot even imagine. We don't want to imagine. So I think that's the one thing which I don't think people have done a good enough job of explaining that why it's such a big deal. Yeah. And what um, Ram Kumar had a follow-up to that is like, what can private citizens do? How can they be more helpful to explain the point you just made. I mean, obviously the media has its role, governments have its role, but for people who are listening to this, people who are watching this, many of whom may be influencers in their communities, many of whom may have, uh, may be running companies, may be uh, influential in their towns. Uh, what can they do um, to uh, yeah. sort of get this, this sentiment out there? I would give you something very specific. Start the conversation. Don't hesitate to start conversations. If you are in an elevator with me these days, chances are I'm going to ask you, are you vaccinated? I don't care about being politically correct. I'm a stranger. We are both in an elevator for 30 seconds. We are both trying to have small talk. To me, that's meaningful small talk. I'm going to smile and ask you, are you vaccinated? If you say yes, I'm going to say, great. Please talk to others in your family who aren't. If you say no, I'm going to say, why not? And we may spend another 60 seconds after we get off the elevator. So my point again is start conversations wherever you are. 
And yesterday I was meeting a gentleman and we were trying to, you know, there's a business transaction we're working on and he was asking me for my contract. He's in his sixties and I know he didn't want the vaccine and we joked about it. And I said, you know, here are the locations. You go and get your vaccine tomorrow. I get you your contract. Today, he sent me a text. He said, I got my Johnson and Johnson. I want my contract before the end of the week. We both had a laugh. My point is start conversations. That's that's terrific advice. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I have to say, you also have such a, a warm demeanor and a very non-condescending demeanor, which, you know, I can't state this enough. It's really important in a politicized, uh, polarized uh, global atmosphere that we approach these conversations from a place of some humility, some sense of understanding that there is another side, that people may feel differently and that they, they don't need to feel bad for feeling differently. We can change minds without making people feel bad. I, I do Absolutely. think that is the most effective way of, after all, what is the goal? The goal is to convince people uh, that vaccines are going to save them. The goal is not to beat them into submission or to make them admit Absolutely. that they were wrong. Um, and that's really important. And it's a mistake I see um, people I know make. Um, Derek asks via email, what is the status of cooperation between countries in South Asia, at least among medical professionals? Uh, he goes on to say, I get that politically it may be difficult for governments to do so officially, but this disease knows no boundaries, primarily looking at India and Pakistan, he adds. Sure. I mean, look right now, Ravi and Fahim are talking. So there is collaboration right there. And I already see WhatsApp groups where I see Indian and Pakistani doctors talking and collaborating. We all know that in science, we all have been collaborating for years and years. Last year, there was a paper with American, European and Australian scientists all coming together to decipher whether this was a lab leak or a man-made virus or not. So I think there's a lot of collaboration going on. Unfortunately, I don't think that physicians by themselves can win this war. It's too big. Right now in US, the game-changing event that we've witnessed in the past three, four months with singular focus on vaccination, what changed? You know, there was a change in leadership. There was a change in priority in the country. And therefore, all of us were able to coalesce very, very easily. So unfortunately, until the political climate and the economic climate coalesces, physicians can only go so far, but I do see those collaborations happening. That makes sense. You know, a lot of the Asia society audience is, uh, especially I know the Asia 21 cohort, we have a lot of media leaders, we have a lot of uh, CEOs, we have a lot of business leaders, uh, in really in positions of power across uh, South Asia and Asia. Um, speaking for them and to them specifically, what advice would you give them in terms of what, what they can do? What kind of advocacy uh, can they lead in their companies, um, in their regions uh, to combat uh, conspiracy theories, to combat vaccine hesitancy? Sure. Great question. I think it will be different for different organizations. Some may be more advanced than others. But I will try to go right in the middle. If you feel you're at the 50th percentile, once again, it all starts with a good conversation. Bring in influencers to your company. Let them uncover. Give them control. Step back. Don't try to control the narrative. It's okay. Nothing terrible will happen. Because people are already getting their truth from Google and sometimes from WhatsApp and disinformation. You don't want that. You want your business to thrive. You want people to remember you. Uh, as a good leader, bring in good influencers, knowledgeable experts, start a conversation, and you will end up in three places. I think more than 50% of your group will love it. I think, and this has been my experience after talking to so many people, and I know there's so many influencers out there. Number two, you will understand what you can do as a leader, because your group will bring up things that you even didn't know. They will want certain guarantees, certain steps, certain precautions, guarantees is the wrong word, certain workplace accommodations, certain accommodations or processes that they would want changed in your business, in your control that you will be able to very easily do. And you'll say, oh, thank God, I didn't even know about it. If that increases trust, productivity, retention for my group, I'd rather do it. And then you will also understand what is that small 
or relatively large uh, number of people in your group who are simply not going to change. And sometimes it's okay. Uh, you don't want them to change, but just knowing that is an insight that you will be able to use for many, many years in the future. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we're almost out of time. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, a few emails have come in asking very specifically about infertility again. I think this is a theme that keeps coming up among certain sections of, of South Asian population. Um, how best to deal with that issue? How best to convince, I guess, at an individual level, but also a wider policy level, sure. um, that these vaccines do not affect, uh, in, you know, fertility for men. Men seem to be very concerned about this, but also, you know, um, how it interacts with pregnancies. I know there's been CDC guidance here, which right. is very clear on the issue. So I think this myth started with a German epidemiologist in December of last year when he made a very large, it was a long shot, a theoretical connection, which I, I say it's almost somebody saying I saw a flying horse. When you make that sort of a claim, the burden of proof is on you, not on me to try to convince you that horses don't fly. After that, between December, we then saw the Pfizer and Moderna trials. About 70,000 volunteers were enrolled. And there was natural level of some of those participants who became pregnant and their incidence of pregnancy was just the same as if it was the baseline population. So we knew right in December, January, that this is bogus because the numbers were not panning out. On April 21st, 2021, New England Journal of Medicine came out with a pretty large study with thousands of women who had successfully completed their pregnancy, their risk of preterm birth or miscarriage or low gestational weight was no different than general population. There is no incidence of male infertility that I know of. So I think there is no scientific basis. Unfortunately, there's a common theme to conspiracies. Conspiracies typically will make a claim that cannot be, you know, that, that always has this potential fear that people say, oh, what if 10 years later, right? That no one can prove because no one can speed up the clock. And I'll give you three examples. What about the long-term side effects of this vaccine, right? There's no way. Someone can always keep saying, well, what about 10 years later? Similarly, infertility. If I'm an 18-year-old young person today, I may not plan to have children for another 10 years. So once again, you got me there. And the third was recently when this Nobel laureate, you know, uh, there was a big, he, not, he didn't even say that, but the headlines were made that everybody who gets a vaccine will die in two years. Now, those are the kind of, if you see there's a common theme, they will put a fear that cannot be fully debunked today. That has an element of distant future. And actually, I would say, if you think of that, the moment you see a fear like that to me right there, don't go for it because it's just a big claim. I think we are now finding a pattern in these conspiracies. Yeah, and the challenge, of course, is to, is to explain that to enough people, you know, that... Uh, the, the notion that we're all going to die in 10 years is just a bizarre thing to discuss. Sure. Um, let me end by just asking you um, for your sense of what the next two or three months are going to look like. Um, obviously, hard to stick your neck out there and say anything sure. definitive, but it's clear that you know India has been worst off in the region in terms of um, just the sheer force uh, of, of the spread of the virus and also the death toll. Um, uh, and then it began to spread, the Indian variant began to spread to uh, Nepal, to other countries in the region, I know Pakistan as well, but not as badly. Um, are you worried that, that other South Asian countries are going to be hit very hard? Um, and how do you think this will all play out? Sure. So again, I think nothing is 100%. And there's a very technical jargon laden answer, but I'll try to simplify it. I think the way we see the next three months, six months, a year is unfortunately gonna be very asymmetric. It's gonna be different for different countries. It's gonna be different for pockets within the same country. Places like US where strong vaccination drive is going on, we are at 40, 50% already. I think US is unlikely to see a massive wave again. Same for Europe, same for Israel. Places like subcontinent or South Asia or Africa, where vaccine penetration is very low, there is absolutely no guarantee. No one can say how many more waves we are going to see. 
because unfortunately it's just as simple. Either the virus will infect 70 or 80% of the people and then they will develop some form of a community immunity or you catch up with vaccination with 60, 70%. And that's why we keep saying vaccination is the way to go. And the last point, Ravi, is it's not a light switch where at a certain number you'll just see the virus go away. It's just like when, when morning occurs, you know, when, when sun starts rising, it's some that you go through a twilight zone and then gradually you see sunlight. So that's how I think we are going to come out of this pandemic, little by little, minute by minute. With every 10% vaccination, you will see some impact. You will see it will have impact. So don't lose heart. Don't think that there's an inflection point. It's, it's just very gradual. That's going to happen along the way. Yes, there may be an inflection point at 50%, but let's worry less about the behavior of the virus. We will be watching it. Of course, we will be educating people what to do about it. But let's believe that we are the superior species here. We get to control the trajectory of this pandemic and sharpen your focus on vaccination. Just have that sole, clear-cut belief that the best way, the end game is vaccine. Don't get bogged down by the difficulties on that path. Of course, for Southeast Asia, there are many difficulties, but stay focused, cut through those difficulties. And that's the end game to this pandemic. How soon you get to 40, 50, 60, 70% of the vaccination. Yay, science. Uh, Dr. Fahim Yunus, um, thank you so much for that. Um, the, I think the, the humility and the clarity with which you speak, um, I find it incredibly convincing. Uh, I know Asia Society is going to disseminate this conversation across the region to make sure we reach lots of people. Um, and I'm sure many of our listeners who are influencers in their own right will have learned something so that they can impact uh, their, their societies as well. I can't thank you enough. If there are any TV executives in South Asia watching, I hope, I hope they get, get in touch with you for a show because you need to be doing more TV. Um, but thank you for your time and uh, to our viewers as, as well around the world, thank you for watching. This is the most important topic we're gonna deal with this year. Thank you, Ravi, and my very best of luck and best wishes to everyone. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll close the event there.